marvellous. Presented on this program is general in nature. Viewers should seek their own professional advice before purchasing products or services. The producers of this program may receive a fee for commercial arrangements with companies featured in this programming. Now on Sky News Business, this is your money, your call. Welcome to Your Money, Your Call. It's the Bonds edition, therefore it's a Friday night. If you're listening to the podcast, it's not a Friday night, it's some other night. Hi, I'm Mark Todd. I'm joined by Talal Yassin from Crescent Wealth and Tano Pelosi from Antares. And I just want you to think it's the TTT show. They're here to answer any of your questions. Feel free to call us, one 300 30 34 35. The email is yourmoney@skynews.com.au. I hope you'll enjoy the show because I'm certain to do, to do that. Because first, I want to talk to Talal about... Crescent Wealth. Who is Crescent Wealth? What, what, what's the business? Well, it's nice to be here, Mark. Well, it's early days. But you're confusing me with the TTT. I know. I call you Todd I, now. Like it's Tano, Talal, Todd. Yeah, anyway, no, it's confusing we'll me. So let me answer the question. <laughs> Crescent Wealth is Australia's first and only uh, responsible and Islamic investment firm. Yep. At the superannuation level and at the managed investment level. We, uh, that basically means we're a socially responsible fund yep. that focuses not only on how we make money, but in what we invest. And so we're a company that invests socially, uh, socially responsibly, but that we deliver. Deliver a return, deliver the service, and deliver good social values. So one, one of the things about you know, the way the social investments have evolved over time is that people are still looking to get the right return, like a get a return. It's, it's, you know, it used to be a philanthropic, let's put some money to work for socially responsible investing and we don't care about the, the outcome. But that's evolved. That, yeah. That's now not the circumstance. It's saying you can have both. You can have your cake and eat it too in respect of socially responsible and still get a, a reasonable outcome. Well, I, think, I think that, that dichotomy or juxtaposition is, is, is old world now, mm. uh, if I may say so. Um, it used to, you know, you can have your cake and eat it, you can get performance and you get socially responsible investment. Uh, today, socially responsible investment is growing phenomenally around the world. Uh, it is increasingly not listed in alternative class, or something if you're just a green and you're worried about the world. Mm. People uh, are worried about what's happening to their world and are wondering how their investments are going to affect their world. And so we're part of that movement, in fact. And in Australia, we've got a huge pickup. We've got 7,000 members in the space of three and a half years yeah, of right. people who want a good return because it's about their superannuation and their retirement. And so they want to retire in dignity and honour, but they want to know that they have a choice to invest uh, in investments that accord with their values, but at the same time give an opportunity to retire. Yeah, right. I say, uh, I use the Apple example which I've used with you before. All investment funds and all investment firms and all superannuation funds sell apples. They can sell red apples and blue apples and green apples, and we happen to sell organic ones. Yep. But at the end of the day, they've got to taste nice. Yep. They've got to be fit for purpose. They've got to give a return. Because you can have the best apples in the world, the, more, the most organic, but if they don't give good return, they're not apples. We grew up in the same suburb. This is what it's been like. You know, growing <laughs> up in the same suburb and saying, OK, what are your interests? And so trying you, to, trying was to there an orchard by any chance? And there was no orchard <laughs> where we grew up. So that was, it's interesting he's talking about the apples. We apples. visited for the apples. Um, now, Tana, uh, you and I have known each other for a pretty long time. And I, I described you as a conservative man by nature, and that's appropriate for the bond market. And you were talking about, well, hang on, in the era of barbarians at the gate, you'd have been a wild man. Um, Let's talk about Antares, who they are, the size of them. I, I was talking to um, one of your management team and he was saying you've seen really good inflows. So can you give everyone a sense of who Antares are and, and why people are giving money and what, what the mix is yeah, and sure. what you're looking at? So Antares is uh, it's a direct asset management of NAB mm -hmm. and 100% owned and it co it's comprised of the equities business and a fixed income business. The fixed income business uh, as it has been pretty much part of NAB now for, for a long, very long time. Its uh, history goes back to the early 90s. So there's a, a fair bit of uh, sort of history there. Um, we manage about 26, 27 billion. That's just on the fixed income side. And we cover pretty much the spectrum of fixed income all, all the way from sort of very conservative cash type funds right through to Lots sort of, of liquidity. A lot of liquidity and then some clients that's all they want, they just want liquidity, they want to be able to get uh, bank bills plus something 
And then there's other clients that are clearly looking at the, the universal indices, like the, the, yeah, these composite type indices, uh, which forms the rump of our business. And then there's inflation-linked bonds and asset liability type mandates and a few other sort of bespoke strategies. So help the people understand what an asset liability mandate is, because I think I want all the people who are watching this show to have an asset liability mandate mentality to a part of your portfolio. Cause, so what did I just ask them to do? Well, typically mandate? it's been the preserve of life insurance companies and the like that uh, have asset liability matched. So as, as you can appreciate... Liability is a pension. Liabilities, yeah. Right. Obligation so, to make a pension. Right. So, so, you know, particularly with the regulation as it is these days, not just on banks, but particularly on insurance companies, uh, in many respects they were moving a lot further down this, this path a lot earlier, that uh, they had to essentially find assets that matched off their liabilities. And some of these companies have very long tail liabilities. Mm -hmm. um, you think about, it, say, uh, even a general insurance company and that has long tail workers' compensation risks, that sort of thing. So they need to find assets that offset <coughs> the risks that come with li the, the liability side. And, and ideally, <coughs> Uh, assets that actually match off quite neatly you know, across the, the, the yield curve, if you will. So you, you try to minimise the lumpiness if you can. And, and you know, the bond market has assisted greatly in that regard uh, by, you know, we've seen a lot more bond issuance across the curve. So it's really about just clearly matching uh, liabilities with assets. So you're matching off duration. Yep. Um, Talal, when it comes to that sort of stuff, you said you had 7,000 uh, members how would you characterise their, their, their profile in terms of risk appetite? The, the, way, the way you think about, you know, you, you invest in a lot of property. Um, are they looking for really liquid assets or are they looking to what we're talking about here where right. you've got people who are superannuants and saying, look, I'm going to be here for 30 years. I want to have steady returns over that 30 years. So that's the liability, how long you're alive, what the costs are. Is that the sort of investment style that you are applying to your members? Like, how do you think about it? In, in, indeed. So, so we, we divide it into two. So we're a superannuation fund, and, we, and I'll describe the characteristics of our fund. Sure. And then we have managed investment schemes. That we focus that we've got an international equities product, an Australian equities product, a property product, and cash. And we'll talk about property. It's the flavour of the month uh, in a little bit. But we have grown to 7,000 members because, from a super fund perspective, we're built on trust, authenticity, and credibility. We take medium, low to medium risk for medium return over the long term. The average age of one of our members is a range of 27 to 32. Wow. Uh, so a very young fund and we have uh, skyrocketed in the last four years to 7,000 members individually one by one by one because they're looking for uh, investment funds that accord with their ethical and responsible values but at the same time, they're looking to retire in dignity and honour. And so we've got them for the, hopefully for the long run. Yep. And uh, we look to invest in things that are risk mitigated and they give a medium return. No risky stuff. I mean, wouldn't be at the end that Tano is investing in, but because of our size and our nimbleness, we're able in each of those uh, underlying products uh, that feed into the superannuation fund to be quite nimble and, 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 and active in that regard. How many people work on the investment team that, that helps you get to those decisions? Like how do you how do you come to the grips with okay I'm gonna I know you bought a property in Melbourne and it did sure. really well. So sure. help me understand the investment process around trying to find the the you know the filters mm -hmm. and then how you then apply that to So let's talk about the investment team first. And so it consists of three levels. So the first level is our investment committee, uh, which we would argue is one of the best investment and at least leading investment committees in the country. Uh, it's chaired by Nick Whitlam and has uh, luminaries of the investment industry for a relatively small and new fund. And we take it very seriously to have the right skill set around us. Um, our investment, our chief investment officer is a gentleman by the name of uh, Mr. Ronan Walsh, who is, uh, as far as I'm concerned, a rock star in the industry and is very supportive and purposeful about his investment philosophy. And he's invested in, uh, he's worked in companies, worked for companies as big as Rest Super, Vic Super, NAB, MLC, and certainly has a lot of skill set and passion about what we do. Sure. And then we've got the rest of the investment team internally that uh, looks to the investment filtering process what we look to invest in, what our asset allocations are. In addition to that, obviously, we have an outsourced asset consultant and the best of breed investment managers because we are a super fund. We're a fund of funds. We don't invest our monies directly, but we keep a very close eye on it. 
You're right. Um, 26 billion. Yes. How many people? You seven. 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 It's, you it's, must be you know, working it's, hard. It's, we, we work very How'd hard. How did you go this year? Were they happy with you? Reasonably well, reasonably well. I mean, the, look, the, you know, the, we always want more, right? Mm. So uh, the the markets How are challenging. How do you do that? Like, when you have seven people looking after twenty six billion, is that more about process and about because of the size of the investments that you're doing? So is it more about we need to understand having we? It's, it's in other words, the collective. If we are, I don't want to make this bad. But if we ask how many years you've been in the business with your seven, it would be a lot of years. It is. Like, like Ken. I think between him. Ken, Mark and myself, the three PMs, it's about 100 years. Yeah. So I only say that very quietly between you and Very mind. quietly, because Ken might be watching. <laughs> um, so but, but the, the, to answer how does your that question, work? How do you get that together? Look, how do you make fixed it? income, and I think this is where it probably differs to other asset classes in what we're talking about here, is a very scalable business. So... If you get the parameters right, you've got very good systems. It tends to be very systems yep. driven. So all the hard yards are done early on. So we, we spend a lot of time in trying to building up analytics, our systems, our risk management tools. So that, that is, a, I guess, a sunk cost, but it pays dividends in the long run. Because so, you can put so much product absolutely. in there. Absolutely. You know, and you know, even the portfolio managers get very heavily involved, very hands on with uh, understanding the analytics, the systems, because fixed income is very, at the end of the day, it's all about risk management. And clearly, you know, it's, it's, it's very asymmetric with fixed income. You can't Absolutely get it wrong. Absolutely binary, right? So Absolutely if, if, very binary. If they get it you wrong. You can't get it wrong. So what he means by this, folks, is if you get it wrong, you don't get your money back. It's not like in equities where if you get it wrong, uh, Telstra might go down 10%, oh, I got that wrong. But Telstra exists. In fixed income, if you get it wrong, you do not get the cash back. And that's where you get the conservative guys saying, I might lose all my money, so I just want to make sure I've got uh, a very good likelihood of it coming back. And this is one of the reasons why typically fixed income people have a very technical bent, because they, they really have to understand the systems. Fixed income itself is fairly quantitative, so the two are sort of hand in hand. But to answer your first question, it's a scalable business, <coughs> and that's why you, you tend to think of fixed income like the Pinkos, the Black Rocks of this world. It's all about size, volume, uh, and the fees, of course, uh, you know, tend to be the trade-off. Yeah, the modest boost. Um, so tell me about the markets that you're trading. How have they been? Is, it, is, it a, is there a sense that it's frothy? You know, what, what are your thoughts around, and help people understand it, you know, you're predominantly property. Uh -huh. That'd be, is that right, or is it...? Uh, no, no, we, 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 we've got an asset allocation. It's, we like property. We're, yeah. we, we've got a, our property fund's been doing really, really well, and uh, we're at Morningstar rated number one for this year, yeah, and right. number t of, of all property uh, yeah, right, funds okay. in the country, and uh, number th two over the last three years. Okay. Uh, but before I just answer that question, I, I've, I've got to say that, uh, and, and I omitted to mention earlier that neither Crescent uh, Wealth nor its products uh, is affiliated or associated with Crescent Capital Partners. That's oh, that's quite right. to say so, that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, as part of the when, when we do some media, but um, what we're seeing in the market is, in one word, dislocation. As far as I'm concerned. Yep. And a dislocation is about in in listed markets and in global markets is that we're seeing all this uncertainty, which traditionally would rock the markets, which traditionally would affect them or the confidence of the market would go down. So we have Trump tweeting Nazi style things and criticising, you know, the Prime Minister of uh, the UK. We have Brexit on the horizon. We have a simmer, simmering situation in North Korea. We have a seismic earthquake politically effectively in the Middle East. Yep. I mean, just five years ago that would have affected the confidence of the market and it seems to be just going up and up with the, I think the Dow uh, up across 23,000 and the yeah. ASX across 6,000. So that's what we're seeing. Okay. Uh, but we believe in property. We'll talk a little bit after the break about why that is. Um, but we'll take a short break. we really love it if you want to give us a call. one 300 35. We'll talk to you soon. You're watching Your Money, Your Call on Sky News Business. Days go by the definitive Daryl Braithwaite collection. Featuring all of his classic hits from the last 40 years. Daryl Braithwaite, days go by.
Toyota Prado. Luxury that goes anywhere. Oh, what a feeling. Toyota. Here's Patrick. He's looking up this property's potential price with a free ANZ property profile report. And here's Angus. He's tapping on walls because that's just what people do. Know what to know. Search ANZ Buy Ready. Telco holding you back. Maybe it's time to cut loose and come on over to Vodafone. This switching season, we're getting into the spirit of things by giving big. With a huge 15 gig of data every month for just $40 a month. That's more than double the data. So ditch your old Telco and switch to Vodafone for the gift that keeps on giving. Spend more time hunting that classic car then searching for the best exchange rates. Switch to OFX for locked-in competitive rates. Make the smart move. OFX.com forward slash switch. When Mr. and Mrs. Peterson go on holiday, they expect their travel insurance to keep up with the Petersons. With WorldCare Comprehensive Travel Insurance, they're ready for whatever their vacay throws at them. Ready with 24-7 overseas emergency assistance. Ready with unlimited overseas medical cover. Ready to roll. Buy your travel insurance by January 31 and get 10% off using promo code SUMMER. Visit worldcare.com.au and let us take world care of you. Jones and Co. Tuesday night. Articulate, outspoken, informed, intelligent, provocative. We are. We are. Well, I don't know how we're going to go, Alan. <laughs> like a cracker, eh? Well, the one thing is for sure, it won't be dull. Eight o'clock. Don't miss it. With your money, your call. Welcome back to Your Money, Your Money, Your Call. I'm Mark Topping the Lab. I'm joined by Talal Yassine from Crescent Wealth and Tanner Pelosi from Antares. And they'll answer any questions. Feel free to call us. It's 1300 30 34 35. Uh, Tanner and I are trying to make bonds sexy, and it's really hard. So we're going to work on some war stories that get it very exciting. In terms of war stories, <coughs> tell me about the conversations that you're having with clients right now. Is it something that you are saying, I'm struggling to make it interesting, and they're saying, that's fine? because everything else is so hot. It, you know, what are the conversations that you're having right now? Well, okay, so the first thing is we, we can't talk about what the conversations that we're having. No, no, but I mean in but terms what, of... But what I can tell you is what themes. we're saying. Yeah, but it's also... No, no, what, yeah. uh, sorry, let me rephrase that question. Yeah. A client is coming to you with something, uh, wanting to solve a problem, and I'm saying, what are the conversations that they're having right now? Are they coming saying, look at the heat in the bubble in these other assets, so I want you to be even more conservative because I'm worried about this? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's that idea. There's two, so there's two, there's they... two big issues. Yeah. One is preserving liquidity. And in typically what we see in these cycles is that we tend to trade off liquidity for, for, for return, expected yep. returns. Yep. So the smart investors, I think the, you know, the ones with the, the white hair, are thinking let's just be careful here and preserve liquidity because uh, for two reasons. One, you want to have a bit of firepower when the market turns yep. and, and you know, valuations cheapen up. And secondly, it just makes good sense, just given where valuations are right now. So does it feel, are you nervous about where other asset clients, like even are you worried, you know, we hear um, uh, high yield European credit is at 2%. I mean, that's not high yield. So no. Nick Bishop came on from Aberdeen saying that's just a cr crazy. So is that something it, that it worries It is, you and, now? and that's probably the other, I won't say conversation, but the other thing we're certainly alerting our clients to is that, look, we, we ask the question, do you really want to push the envelope here and these, you know, realising these are the risks that come with that or do you want to sort of pare back your expectations, preserve your capital to a large extent, maybe also preserve liquidity and be in a strong position when the market eventually turns and at some point it's going to turn. Uh, you just can't get these sort of Bitcoin type scenarios playing out yeah. in the fixed income markets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, a couple of weeks ago we had a, a, a viewer ring up and say, look, um, or email in, I want to know how to short Bitcoin. And if we had worked out a way to do it, you would have lost a lot of money. Uh, it went through $10,000.
Um, tell me about the Islamic investment world. Um, what's it like to be an Islamic investor? How does that play out in the broader community? I mean, what, what are the challenges with that? So our uh, challenges are than in Islamic compliant investors, same as everybody else's actually. Yep, okay. Uh, you remember that our investment philosophy is uh, basically a filter. And other than that, we have the same shoals of the, the waves and the market. And that is, we don't invest in gaming, uh, gambling, alcohol, alcohol, tobacco, um, unsafe, speculative uh, kind of investments. Yep. So not at the end of where Tano is, but we, we tend to be risk mitigated to a large degree. And so, I mean, our, our goals are to protect capital of our investors yep. and to make sure that they get a reasonable return over the longer term. And it's a financial literacy game in the sense that if you're 32 or 33 uh, or 20, but somewhere between those 27 and 33 and your average is about 30 to $40,000 to perannuation as you start your career, well, it's about educating about the process. Yep. On a property front, I guess our members and customers are looking for stable returns, long-term capital growth, inflation protection, and I guess no surprises. And so over the last three years, we've averaged about 15% per annum annualized Whoa. for property. And so between the REIT market and between direct property investments, that's the Melbourne building yeah. you mentioned earlier, we've, we've done pretty well, thank God. Cool. We have a caller from Melbourne. Sure. Uh, Andrew from Melbourne's calling. Hello, Andrew. How can we help you? Oh, hi, Mark. I was just wondering, Australian 10-year bond yields are within about 10 basis points of US 10-year bond yields. I was just wondering if they crossed over and you had uh, lower yields in Australia than the US, what impact that would have on the uh, Aussie dollar versus the US dollar? It's a great... I mean, I, I, I don't know, Andrew, because... Sorry, I do know what's going to happen, but I, I'm, what I'm saying to you is I don't know, Andrew, and if we get this right, I've actually created a chart that I sent through uh, earlier today, and it's uh, after question 11, I think it is. So if you could bring up that chart, that would be great because that is... No, it's the next one. So, Andrew, this is the next chart. This is the chart that we're talking about. So what we're looking at here is the two curves. The blue one is the Australian one. The green one is the US curve. So you can see that it gets really steep because cash rates are so low. And then you're seeing the steepness in the blue one. That's because Australia is... You know, it's not the US. The US has got a lot, much larger curve. So you can see that it's starting to cross over. There's some challenges around it. Do you want to walk through, Tano, as a pro, how you think that plays into the currency? Because, Andrew, this is a great question, because this is about the currency. This is where it plays out, in my mind. Yeah, so typically it's the front rates that drive the currency, the, the differentials between the front rates. So most currency analysts use something like a, a two-year swap rate. So, for example, a two-year... You can even look at a two-year bond rate, but let's take a two-year swap rate in the US versus the two-year swap rate in Australia, and that's already flat to inverted. Yeah. So the market's already telling you that there is some downside risk here, from, even from here, uh, for the Aussie dollar. And now, it, you know, I think if you get the Aussie 10-year bond rate inside the US 10-year bond rate, which I think is a good chance of happening, uh, that just, just sort of seals the deal. But, but, you know, at the end of the day... So seals the deal means the Aussie gets sold... Now, we had Nick Bishop last week saying no, he didn't think because of some uh, structural, uh, um, structural drivers in the Aussie, and I disagree with Nick, and, and um, Lambo was very diplomatic and didn't. So I think Tano's on my side. I'm less diplomatic. So I, I would say... I would say that, that so true. <laughs> I would say we are at very different points in our respective business cycles. And this is really going to play out, I think, clearly in the currency. But before it does that, it plays out through... The, the, the front end interest rate differentials and then ultimately through the long end. But as Mark's spot on, it comes through in the currency. So there's, I mean, I would also add there's a lot of technical pressure here for the Aussie dollar to come off as well. So it's all conspiring at the same time, I think, to put a bit of downward pressure on the Aussie dollar. The only thing that can sort of save us is if the Fed takes its foot off the accelerator in terms of rate hikes. Yep. And uh, I think then you start getting you know, we tend to look at the forward pricing in markets and then you would have to see a real sort of capitulation or pullback in terms of what the Fed is going to do next year. Um, 
And one other thing is the Fed have got it wrong for the last three or four years in respect of what they thought rates would do. And they haven't done anywhere near what they thought in terms of lifting rates, and that's about inflation. And when I say inflation, he starts to twitch, so I'm going to go to him, because we don't <laughs> want to talk about inflation just yet. Uh, uh, Talal, um, what we're talking about right now is in respect of our economy and what rates we can hold. And sure. so we're saying, broadly speaking, our economy isn't strong enough to hold higher rates. But how does it feel to you as a, you know, you have, you're involved in a lot of Australian businesses, you've, you know, you, you, you've got a broad sure. footprint. Sure. And part of the businesses that you do is you have a lot of people who come and speak yes. at Crescent Wealth and you do presentations, you'll have Rudd and you'll have all these people sure. come and speak. Um, what's your sense of the economy from, from your vision, from your perspective? How do you see it? Well, personally, um, I guess, and from a Crescent Wealth point of view, we, we're not harsh optimists, but we're not also doom and gloom agents. Um, Australia's had a brilliant run for 26 years. Mm. We're famous for being the commodity-linked product uh, country to China. Our commodity markets collapsed. You know, Western Australia has closed down. Brisbane closed down before then. We've we've migrated to a services-based economy, and we've had 26 years of solid growth. We are clearly the lucky country, as far as I'm concerned. Mm. And I think the property market has also contributed to that. And our uh, how close we are to, I guess, China and those markets. When you put all that together, I'm still bullish about the Australian market. I, I can't see a bubble festering away and about to explode. I, th I guess um, generally the people predicting these things think the interest rates are going to remain low, inflation is going to remain under control. Um, I don't know about bond rates and where they're going to go, so I wouldn't want to venture into Dad's that debate. that on a bond show. Yeah, I know, but, but there's ex two experts here. <laughs> so call it when, you'd, when, when you're not an expert in the area, and I'm certainly doing that. But from my point of view, uh, in terms of winning mandates, I'm thinking that from a bond perspective and a fixed income perspective, it'd be a lot harder to get mandates right now in some instances where we, we, we are protected against that in terms of our aged care investments and our medical centre investments and our property investments which are direct, they're asset based and they're asset backed and their return profiles are 9 to 15 per cent per annum. Big institutional investors, so you are, you are actually winning mandates. We are. Yeah, we are. so it's one of those things that it's interesting. That's why I was trying to get that sense of what the customer is saying because you are winning mandates from the big end of town and they are probably saying I want liquidity, I want to be safe, you know, that, that's the driver. I think the, the, the differentiator for us is that, you know, no matter what type of environment we're in, we, we're always thinking about the risk and are we priced accordingly for you that risk? Well or not? Are you okay? I, I, not always. <laughs> <laughs> not always. That's probably got more to do with my two young daughters staying up. Right, late. that could be it. Okay, so, but, but the thing is, you know, we, we're always thinking about is the illiquidity being priced correctly? Is credit risk being priced correctly? Mm -hmm. is, um, is the term premium priced correctly? So we're always thinking about the risks uh, because ultimately if you're not thinking about the risk, you're essentially in bubble territory and, you know, you're, you're, you're looking at... We're just at hoping. You might not be in bubble territory if you're not thinking about the risk, you're just hoping. Well, you're clearly moving. Worse, well, yeah. you're clearly moving away from fair values. You're, you're so, an equity investor. Well, you're clearly moving away from fair values. So, and, and, and then, and then you know, then, and then when you have this reversion to the mean, then you know you're found wanting. So, we're always thinking about uh, being pricing, pricing the risk. What's the market discounting, and how does that compare to what we, how we view the world? Um, because if it's too tight, then we're going to back off in terms of how much risk we're allocating. Okay, and how does the economy, same as Talal, how does it feel to you when you look at the economy? Because obviously you get economists, you'll have outside, you know, um, you'll have a lot of information from a lot of different sources. So how does the economy feel to you? Uh, we are inundated with information. Yeah, so absolutely. ultimately at the end of the day, you need to sit back, uh, process everything and make your own decision and assessment. And I think there's two key things that have happened over the last few years. There's been a massive pull forward in valuations. We can thank central banks for that. And the second thing is because of the collapse in yields and, and, and expected returns, uh, because of this pull forward, the risk envelope is pushed a lot more aggressively. Okay, gotcha. Look, we'll take a, a, uh, a second break for the night. We'll be back soon. Uh, it was great to get a call from Andrew. Please keep calling 1300 30 34 35. Talk to you soon. You're watching Your Money, Your Call on Australia's Business Channel. With iInet's limitless broadband data, there's no end to what you can watch, stream or download. And it's just...
just $69.99 a month on a no luck in contract! Release your internet's potential with IINet, the number one in customer service. Oh, broken again, mate. Yeah, my DIY didn't do the trick. I think you should try Poolworks. Make your pool shimmer with a free clarifying pool treatment when you spend $100 or more in store. And don't forget, we come to you. Plus, there's more great products in store. Pool works for healthy pool people. Why prick your finger when you can scan? With the new Freestyle Libre Flash Glucose Monitoring System, you can check your glucose levels anytime, anywhere. You can even check them when you're out and about. With the Freestyle Libre System, just scan the sensor to see your current glucose levels and trends and manage your diabetes accordingly. You can do it without lancets. Order yours today at scantocheck.com.au. Moving to a new country shouldn't be hard for your money. Switch to OFX to express your transfers. Make the smart move. OFX.com forward slash switch. This is Christmas Carol. And now she's totally wrapped. Because everyone in her family wins thanks to the $1,000 FPOS card she got with her new seven-seat Outlander. Just $29,990 at the Mitsubishi Kickstart Christmas Sale. Plus, there's Lancer Black Edition Auto, also with a $1,000 FPOS card. Hurry into the Mitsubishi Kickstart Christmas Sale. The time of your life starts now. Is your telco holding you back? Why not cut loose and come on over to Vodafone? This switching season, we're giving you a massive 15 gig of data every month for just $40 a month. So ditch your old telco and switch to Vodafone. Did you notice that there are so many different prices out there for the exact same room? I know I've been asking this a lot lately, but this is what it really means. The same hotel room can have up to 10 different prices across the internet. So even if you spend a lot of time looking around, chances are it's still out there for a better price. So make one last check before you book. The Trivago check. Trivago compares prices from more than 200 websites to make sure you find your ideal hotel for the best price. Hotel Trivago. Now, back with your money, your call. It's everywhere. Welcome back to Your Money, Your Call. I'm Mark Todd from The Nab. If you want to email me directly, it's mark.todd at nab.com.au. I'm joined by Talal Yassin from Crescent Wealth and Tano Pelosi from Antares. They're here to answer any of your questions. Feel free to call us on 1300 30 And the email is yourmoney at skynews.com.au. Now, Andrew rang through and had a great question on basically the two different yield curves and what would happen. One of the things that professional investors are talking about at the moment, folks, is the thing called the twos, tens curve in the US dollars. So if you think about lending money to somebody for uh, a week, you have a certain interest rate. If you want to lend it for a month, it's a probably a higher interest rate. 10 years, it's a much higher interest rate. Because you think about what's the risk and all the stuff that Tano talks about in terms of what's the likelihood binary getting your money back. So the graph that we're about to show you is called the twos, tens curve, and a lot of people are talking about it, and Tano has been talking about it. So if we can bring that up, I can show you what that is. Now, if you can see the slide, this is the differential between the two-year bond rate and the 10-year bond rate, and so the margin between the two. As they compress, the returns you're getting for the longer investment are getting less. In other words, the margin you're picking up is getting less. Why do people worry about it? Well, uh, for one very good reason. The, the US yield curve particularly has been a very good predictor of recessions. So if you take the last four recessions, I think pretty much from 81, we can, uh, we can list them, 81, 91, uh, 2001, 2, and then 07, 08, the US 2s, 10s went flat to inverted each time. So look, it didn't do it always straight prior to uh, prior to the actual recession but it, it in each case it was inverted so so I, I tend to say it's the smartest guy in the room uh, because when you think about it economists tend to call you know for the last uh, three 
sort of recessions. But this this is a very good, reliable predictor. The only caveat I would put out there... There's got to be a massive caveat on this one because it yeah, doesn't... And that's feel. what I'm getting to. So, okay. And I think we're on the same page on this. So this time we know the term premium. So, so essentially yield curves are flattened because of QE. So... So QE has essentially driven risk premiums down everywhere, including the risk premium that you're getting between a 10-year bond yield and a two-year bond yield. So, folks, what he's talking about in terms of risk premium is what return do you get? If I lent the money to, to Tano, uh, I might get one interest rate. That, that interest rate above cash is my risk premium. So cash is at one and a half. I might want two and a half. If I lend it to my 18-year-old son and he was in the bad books, I might want three and a half. That's a risk premium. That's the likelihood of getting paid back. So I want an extra margin above. Um, the one, of one of the things that you would be thinking about in terms of margin is hybrids. What margin are you getting when you invest? 375, 4%. That's the risk premium above the reference rate, which is BBSW. And there's, a, and there's another risk premium you need to think about. If I'm going to lend my money to you for two years, it's going to have a different yield to what it would have, say, for 10 years because it just, I'm taking a lot more risk, including yep. credit risk, Absolutely. counterparty risk. So the problem is that risk, that risk premium that I normally would have attracted on buying a 10-year bond yield has been compressed because by all the central, buying of central banks around the world. Absolutely. Okay. So hence we have a situation where yield curves now are very flat. Um, I think the, the two tens in the US is something like 50, 60 basis points and potentially could get to negative without the US going into recession just yet. Yep, and, and I'm not on the recession front, I'm, I'm on the non-inflation front. So that's one of the things that Tano's gonna talk about when I ask him, so I'm giving him a chance to think about it. And the other thing I want him to think about is, where is the positive side to your world around what's a good investment to be in? But because I've always got a very positive friend here in Talal, um, I can find out what you think is a good value. So, so where would you think, for the viewers here, because we wanna give them something tangible, um, is it in Melbourne property? Is it you know Western suburbs property? Well, like where do you see good value at the moment? Well, let me say to be very very positive that Cresmorph is the world leader in pioneering socially responsible investment that delivers. Yep. Okay. That's number positive. one. You want, yep. That's overflowing. Like that. Okay. Where we see value? Well, we see value in commercial property rather yep. than residential. We see residential across the nation not as uh, attractive as others. We see a lot of value in niche sectors like aged care, healthcare, community, because it's quasi-government. Yep. And because, whilst not guaranteed, it's got a, a significant proportion, a mature proportion. Good tenant. Is, is, is a, it's a great tenant and is, is, is backed by fed, the federal government. And it also ticks the philosophical box for us in terms of being good for society and humanity. In terms of actual cities, well, we see Brisbane is making a sort of a bit of a comeback, but it tanked a little while ago. Um, so, uh, sorry, Perth ma is making a bit of a comeback. Brisbane continues to have a vacancy rate of about 15%, which is not great. Sydney powers on in a commercial sense. Sydney, there's, if you did a crane test, I mean, there was five new cranes in the last, in the last couple of months. And, but Melbourne, for us, is the commercially the most strong. And we bought property in Melbourne and went out of Melbourne uh, uh, on, a, on an opportunistic basis, which is unusual for a superannuation fund, but we just, it's an opportunity we could not let our members uh, yep. go. And despite the decrease in the clearance rate, the decrease is less than Sydney, is less than Sydney. And so if you're looking for a direct answer, Sydney and Melbourne are still the cities. Melbourne is slightly ahead of But in commercial Sydney, property. But in commercial property. Yeah, right. Okay. That's where we see opportunity in aged care, health care and communities. And what sort of returns are you getting in the total fund? So you're getting 15 in property. What's the, what's the average fund? Well, on a three to five year rolling basis, it's about seven to eight percent yeah. on a balanced basis on a, on a top level. Uh, but each of the international equity was getting 13 percent to 14 percent a year. Yeah. It, it came down somewhat to about two or three percent. But average out, and we all, we're medium to long term investors, yeah. it should be in low double digits. Okay. Um, I have a dual question. Yeah. Where, oh, well, let's just go with a happy, sto happy story, okay? Give me a happy story. What do you like? Where's good value? Where can people put their money? Try very hard, Tanner. Uh, look, I think credit. I think credit still offers value. So uh, credit means if you're lending to a company. That, you know, government is not credit. So credit is uh, Foxtel comes to the market and said, look, I want to borrow some money. You go, okay, how many people watch Foxtel? The, the data would be really easy to find because you're all plugged in. So you can work out how many times you spend the you know, X amount of money per month. That's credit. 
Okay. Yeah, it's like, you know, the Antares Income Fund would be focusing on high grade, liquid names. Uh, even some of the banks still offer value, we think. Uh, lowered down the capital structure. You know, we talked about this in the past. Some of the hybrids, sub debt. Yeah, I mean, yeah. they, they still offer value, we think. And, you know, particularly against the backdrop of a fairly benign sort of fundamental fundamentals. Yep. And I think the, the, the general uh, argument here is also that we've seen, in, in a, without a doubt, a, a massive improvement in the credit quality of financial institutions, just given the re regulation of that sector, uh, you know, BAL 3, BAL does that 4. Worry you? Does that worry you about um, the, the Trumpdom? You know, the, the, the Dodd Frank? Look, I think this is really interesting. The equity story around banks is so solid in the US because of what they think they're about to do around Dodd-Frank and about the changing cycle. Yet, if I'm an investor, I don't want the banks to take on more risk. They've done so, you, you, you've improved the credit quality to an extent that people are flooding them with money. Do you think banks want to take on more risk? Is that like, does that make well, sense? Well, I think we could be talking about two very different types of risks here. I mean, look, I think what's happened... Uh, so, so some of the safeguards that have been put in place are definitely here to stay. I think you've got now mechanisms that provide a lot more liquidity. Uh, you think about, say, Australia, for example, with the RBA now providing liquidity to institutions in, 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 uh, in times of distress. Uh, you've got these backstops. You've got high quality liquid assets now that feature quite prominently on the balance sheets of all banks and I think that's here to stay so so that underpins the bond market but also underpins their own liquidity in times of stress so these are these things are not changing in the short term yeah so again um, it's like I'm like you know um, investopedia tonight high quality liquid assets HQLA are assets that banks own that at any point in time they could easily sell them. So they buy a lot of these to keep stability within their banking sector and if they can't sell them, the government um, uh, will repo them. So what the government, they can pledge them to the government, they can pledge them and they'll get some money back. And so they'll be able to use that money to fund their performance and, and that sort of stuff. Um, for you, I guess, being a positive guy, yep. I want to know what worries you. What are you worried about at the moment? So, I don't mean personally, I mean in terms of... I was about of, to just launch exactly, into that Don't one. tell me about the kids <laughs> won't do their homework. I just mean, in terms of that sense that, yeah. okay, what's the challenges right now? Is it, you know, having such a young uh, um, bunch of investors, you know, yeah. young members, you know, that's interesting and would create different dynamics. Yeah. So what worries you? I think the main worry I have is, I'm always thinking medium to long term. Yep. The main, well, one of the worries I have is this liquidity issue. So we talk about liquidity as if always it's a very positive thing. And to some extent it is, yep. but not always. So uh, the rules and regulations around superannuation funds, if I have uh, uh, correctly understood it, is at least 80% of your funds on a super level needs to be in liquid assets. Yep. And that was a response to the global financial crisis when you, know, you couldn't sell assets and you got stuck and people can take the money out. Yep. The problem with that and the presentation of that is that, you know, it's, 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 it's heavy liquid stocks. And so if there is a run on the market, if there's another banker's crisis, i.e. the global, then you could lose 50, 60% of your capital. Yep. That means you can't have a fixed asset that's returning 15% in the agricultural investment. Or, and I'm not saying it should be the other way. What I'm saying should be a bit more balanced. Now, I'm sure there are counter arguments to that. But generally, that worries me. The market worries me. Now, there's this dislocation we spoke about earlier on. Uh, where the events, they're not the same anymore in terms of one thing that would, you know, cause uh, something else to occur, i.e. a political crisis will cause the lack of confidence in the markets. Uh, the Dow Jones would lose, some, would lose something. The ASX would lose something is not happening. And so my fear is we've lost that sense of causation in terms of investment and that out of the blue, 20, 30% gets wiped off the global markets. So Nobody can predict that. How, so do, I'd you, like how do you play out the, the Donald Trump story? How do you think that, that plays out? He's been, he's been effectively elected um, about 13 months ago. He's taken his seat in January. Um, when he would tweet, the, the things that he would tweet about would be impacted straight away. So he'd tweet about um, uh, a, a different company and they would plummet. And then over time, when he tweeted about Ivanka's clothing line yes. being taken out of uh, a retailer, it went down and it came straight back. And there was this point in time where even the algorithm started to ignore the president. How do you think the presidency plays out 
from that that you've just spoken about. Uh, we could have a very seismic crush. When you look at what the president writes about, you think it should be happening at any minute. So, yeah. how do you think that the the, the politics well, of life starts? But, but this is this is the fear that I'm talking about, because in a sense, uh, Trump, to his credit, has done and acts and performs precisely as he promised he would. And that is, he will do anything that it comes to mind. He will tweet overnight. He will threaten a country with nuclear war. Yeah. He will pick on somebody. He will be conflicted. He, 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 he is, I mean, to his credit. But that also means, apart from all the, that goes with, you know, the President of the United States, the leader of the free world, and you know, cheapening that role. It also means he can support Nazis overnight and, you know, and, 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 and be very proud about it. And the world looks at it and says, we, we need to ignore him. The markets are ignoring him. But the problem is the rules of the game change. And that's, we could be on a precipice and all the normal rules of engagement and understanding and analysis will not help us to predict what may come. And so I, you go either one or two ways. You either be say, well, I want to be safe and I want to be certain and I'll retreat the bonds and gold and maybe even Bitcoin. Uh, or you say it's business as usual. I, I think a lot of the market's saying business as usual. <laughs> and, 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 and this is the problem. So that's the fear I have for our fund. Um, we've only got a, bit, a minute before we go to a break. We could be on the edge of a precipice and mm. don't know it. And it seems, I want to get your thoughts on the US economy, how that is such that they seem to have discounted the presidency and you could be on the edge of a precipice yeah. and not know it. Why is that happening? I think, I think there are definitely no less risks in the system. Uh, we're still getting a, then just the same amount of risks. Those risks are, however, propagating in a different way. I think the system's now a lot more, uh, how shall I put it, it's, it's a lot safer. So this, for starters, there's lots le a lot less leverage. Financial institutions, are, as, we, as we earlier discussed, yep, are a lot much better now. So, uh, much better now. So I think it's the way the, that the risks are happening, but they're not getting propagated the same way as they have in the past. They can go back to the back sort, which exactly. is the banks. Um, we have to take, sorry, we have to take a final break for the night. Don't go. Come back. Call us one three hundred thirty thirty four thirty five. Talk to you soon. You're watching your money, your call on Sky News Business. QuickBooks introduces Jeanette and her mobile wedding business. She travels far and wide to celebrate I do's, but Jeanette hates copying all those trips into a logbook. So now Jeanette uses QuickBooks Self-Employed. It tracks her business kilometres automatically. She categorises trips with a swipe and is ready for tax time. Wow, I've never seen tracking mileage look that easy. Way to grow, Jeanette. Never touch a logbook again and save 50% at quickbooks.com.au. The new seven-seat Kia Sorento GT line comes with eight-speed auto, the all-round safety of 360 camera view, and upgraded eight-inch touchscreen. New Sorento, with Australia's best seven-year factory warranty. New colour of Morganite, crafted in 10 karat rose gold from $385. For a limited time, the rare colour of Tanzanite from $569. Exquisitely irresistible. Secrets. When Mr. and Mrs. Peterson go on holiday, they expect their travel insurance to keep up with the Petersons. With WorldCare Comprehensive Travel Insurance, they're ready for whatever their vacay throws at them. Ready with 24-7 overseas emergency assistance. Ready with unlimited overseas medical cover. Ready to roll. Buy your travel insurance by January 31 and get 10% off using promo code SUMMER. Visit worldcare.com.au and let us take world care of you. Other telcos promise big in the switching season, but Vodafone actually delivers with bells on. Because you can never have too much holiday data, Vodafone is giving away a massive 35 gig bonus data over 10 recharges on our prepaid 35 day expiring plans. That's a bonus 3.5 gig per recharge. So ditch your old telco and make the switch this season. Days go by the definitive Daryl Braithwaite collection. Featuring all of his classic hits from the last 40 years. Daryl Braithwaite, Days Go By. You've worked hard making it. 
Spending it should be the easy part. Switch to OFX for easier overseas money transfers. Make the smart move. OFX.com forward slash switch. No matter what drives you, where you are, and where you're going, no matter what dream you're living and which you're still following, you know that life is where you take it. The all-new BMW X3. Now, back with your money, your call. Welcome back to Your Money, Your Call. I'm Mark Top in the NAV, and I'm joined by Tano, sorry, Talal Yassin on my right from Crescent Wealth, and Tano Pelosi from Antares, and they're here to answer any of your questions. We only have a few minutes, so uh, Talal's for all his friends, and they're out there watching. They'd better concentrate. The last five are the best five. Um, tell me why there is no inflation in your mind. Why is that, and why is that important to young people out there? There are a lot of theories circulating at the moment. I won't go through them all, but you know, you've heard them yeah, about robotics. automation, robotics and all that. But I think at the end of the day, it comes down to one major factor. After the GFC, there was a whole lot of scar tissue left. So it, it affected people's psyche. It not only affected the consumer's psyche in terms of being more frugal and you know, watching the pennies, but also the way corporates, corporations deal with their costs their costs. That's we, the big one. And that, I think this is the big one. And we're seeing a massive cost takeout and it's, 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 it's suddenly it's in perpetual motion now. Yeah. To the point where I think even when you get to full employment, I think before they pay a higher wage, they'll continue to look for efficiency gains. Yeah. And you know, Japan kind of shows this uh, it's in its own experience. They've been at full employment for many years, but the companies still look for ways of saving money, efficiency gains, before they'll increase wages. Yeah, I think for the viewers at home, think about what's happening in retail, uh, you know, working in banking, you know, you, you just get a note, we're going to let a, you know, X amount of people go. In retail, everyone is just constantly talking about what's going to happen. Think about then, you know, property markets and the way everything will go online, you can you value it, buy it. it. It is much harder. The internet of everything and the response to the GFC has made inflation very hard to predict. Can I add one, just one final point on that? The markets also have been affected by what's happened in the past. So, you know, we talk about the tips market, the inflation linked markets, their expectations of inflation, essentially they're adjudicating on the sort of banks and they're saying you've got no way of getting back to your, your target zones. So what's inflation. a 10 year uh, inflation linked asset? What, what, what's the rate? Well, they're saying, so the implied inflation expectations is yes. less than 2%. So okay. they're saying over the next 10 years, inflation is going to average at less than 2%, which is historically unprecedented. And so, folks, people who are on the Fed who are saying get it to 2%, some of these people have never seen it at 2% as Fed governors. Like, they just haven't even seen it, and they're old. So while they've been as Fed governors, they've never seen the rate. Oh, wow. Yeah, so get it to this. Um, it's like, uh, get it there because I want to see what it's like. <laughs> um, <laughs> So help me understand for you the white noise. I always want to know how people can cut through the white noise. If people watch this show because they get good information, but there are lots of people trying to provide information. So how do you as an investor get through the white noise? Well, I always watch your show. Thank you. That's to start with. That's a good thing. But I guess we live in the new age, the new norm. Mm. It's the confused. Mm. And so we stick to our investment, Islamic investment principles, and we take, I guess, the filtering system very, very seriously and spend millions of dollars on it to make sure that the white noise of the markets does not affect us. I guess in the age of Trump, um, I honestly believe even if he was impeached, it wouldn't affect the market as it once would. And, and he's hit very quickly heading to that. Uh, the Twitter sphere and everything that's happening in Brexit and Europe and the Middle East is really creating a lot of white noise. I mean, things are coming out every day. I mean, even today, uh, we're talking about the confusion. I'll pull out my phone. The AFR market wrap said this. And I, I, as I was thinking up here, I was, I was coming up here thinking about it, what I would say. It said, ASX upbeat. How worried should shareholders be? Oh, my God. So is that not confused? Yeah. The market's up. You should be worried. I mean, it's, it's both, both coins. I think my view is to stick to actual value and the fundamentals and do what you like and do it properly cautiously but risk mitigated and not to go either way go the middle path perfect 
On that note, go the middle path. I am the middle guy, so I'm going to say goodbye. That's all we have time for tonight. I hope you've enjoyed it. I want to thank Talal Yassine from Crescent Wealth and Tano Pelosi from Antares. I hope you've had a great time and enjoyed it. Thanks to the special audience out the front. Um, I'm Mark Todd from the NAB. Enjoy your weekend. Have a good one. Take care. Information presented on this program is general in nature. Viewers should seek their own professional advice before purchasing products or services. The producers of this program may receive a fee for commercial arrangements with companies featured in this programming. You're watching Sky News Business, Australia's business channel.